want to bring the attention again to the purpose of our study, and that would have been to overlay the book of Daniel on the book of Revelation. So that's the intent of the entire uh, many weeks. But uh, now that we're approaching uh, the, the final part of the uh, the final vision of Daniel and how it's all tying together, then maybe there'll be more emphasis there brought upon the book of Revelation, how it ties in. I began this uh, lesson with wonderf uh, wonderfully instructive <laughs> is the understanding how the consecutive end time prophetical visions of Daniel each connect to the preceding vision or visions at some point. Then, after adding to or introducing new features, it proceeds, the newer vision proceeds to the same terminus or end. That being the end of this age. Being is so instructed, we then also can better comprehend John's end time visions in the book of Revelation. I suppose nothing threw me a curveball as I tried to comprehend the book of Revelation, more than not gathering that, not gleaning that, that fine piece of understanding, wherein yeah, you see it so much clear in the book of Daniel, how that in one uh, respect, I don't need to get into depth explaining it, because I explain it in my notes. For example... It is in the da uh, Daniel chapter two that Gentile, that the Gentile powers over the earth are laid out before us. With the end being, the earth filled with the stone, you know the image Nebuchadnezzar's image, and how it's laid out, and uh, how those typify those Gentile empires and uh, over over the remaining of the time until the restoration of Israel, and how that that. The dream ended with the stone crushing the, the toes and the ankles and feet and then filling the whole earth. So it, it starts with that the Gentile powers and it finishes with the stone filling the earth, Jesus Christ, the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And then you moving from chapter 2 of Daniel into chapter 7, Daniel 7, it begins or picks up towards the end of the Gentile powers image. You know, instead of starting at the head, like, like the second chapter started at Nebuchadnezzar's golden head, with explanation. In chapter 7, uh, it begins towards the end of the image, and then it ends with explanation of the end of the image as to what the types and shadows mean. And then it proceeds on to the end with the Son of Man and the saints being given the kingdom. That's the difference from chapter 2 to chapter 7. And then in chapter 8 and its vision, different vision, it connects the last Gentile king historically with the ancient Greek empire, then ends, you know, the, the, kingdom, the Alexander's kingdom, and then it ends with him being overcome by the prince of princes. So that's chapter 8. Then chapter 9 starts at the ancient time of the decree to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and ends at the time with the final judgments of Israel and the Antichrist. Then chapter 11 begins again with the ancient days of Persia and Greece, and it passes on through time to the rise of the Antichrist, the days of Israel's final judgments, and ends with the end of the Antichrist. That's chapter 11 that we, we have looked at just recently. And then chapter 12 turns back but a short time, just, just real Quickly, back in the vision, it does. It goes to the toes. It goes right. It doesn't go through all that past other history or image 
explanation. It just adds to the end of the vision, the end of the time of the vision. It's, so it, chapter 12 just reverts back just a short time, uh, spiritually speaking, and then proceeds to the final great deliverance and the first resurrection. Now, we're going to, we'll concentrate on chapter 12, so I'll just read uh, the first verse. And at that time, 12.1, Daniel 12.1, and at that time, at what time? At that time that all these things in the 11th vi uh, visions represent. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time and at that time thy people shall be delivered every one that shall be written in the book and then the second verse and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt so Chapter 12 then turns back to a time that is represented in the last of the 70th week of Daniel. And then moves forward to the first resurrection. Represented in the second verse of Daniel, chapter 12. We'll isolate that and we'll speak to it some more. But to enter into the lesson, we're just going to acknowledge this consistency throughout scriptural prophecy, especially that that has to do with end times, especially consecutive visions. that it's this pattern that we can see in the book of Daniel that we can equate to the book of Revelation. First of all, are you with me on understanding what it is that I'm laying out before you? How that, we'll just take this as an example. We'll just draw a line. And this, re this represents... All, uh, all of Daniel's, if I'm going to write, I'll write where you can read it. Daniel's visions. This, this is a chronological time order, okay? So in, so in chapter 2, we have this, uh, this prophecy. We have this prophecy. And it starts and it stops at some point. Then in, in the seventh chapter, we have a vision that starts at some point and ends at one point. That point that starts is, a, is somewhere you know, within the uh, represented, represented in the first dream or the first vision in the second chapter of Daniel. It starts back there and then it finishes this vision too. Vision 1, 2, we'll call this chapter 2, this is chapter 7. And then it, the, the vision in chapter 7 terminates somewhere uh, uh, in that, along that same time frame of vision 1. So I, I probably, there's a better way to, to depict this. So we'll say this is the timeline. So it, it ends in a different place. Uh, or, or maybe at the same place that the first vision uh, laid out for us in skeleton. And then in, in chapter 9, the third vision, we have again a starting point and a finishing point of that vision. And this vision also lay, it lay over, could over, be overlaying this vision, the first vision, it has maybe a starting point and a finishing point that it, you can find in the very first vision. But this is adding more detail or more information on this first 
vision. So th th this vision and this vision, and then, then in the 11th chapter and the 12th chapter, all of this together uh, makes represents Daniel's uh, prophetic end time vision. All of these visions can be incorporated and overlaid because each one of them speak to to that original vision or dream in the second chapter of Daniel. There's a good way of, of uh, depicting that. I should have laid it out for you. I didn't. But that's what I'm trying to express to you, that you, you need to, to have this understanding of Nebuchadnezzar's dream with, when you get to under, so that you can understand the, the, four, the four empires, Gentile empires, represent four beasts, and then, then the four beasts are picked up in, in uh, who they are in chapter 9 and 11, and, and then we finish in 12, recognizing that this, this prophetic pattern is there helps us when we move to the book of Revelation, because it's the same pattern that John has, and his visions uh, are overlay, and even though they are different visions, they're about the one vision, the one end time period, and you can see that he picks up in different times chronologically uh, as he moves forward in the visions, but they all terminate at the end. Each one of them doesn't matter, they all come too close to the same end, their climax. They're all working together to give information, prophetic information, that we all know that they're moving toward this one climax. And this climax is the kingdom of Christ. If you had to summarize what, what is the climax, it's the kingdom of Christ. So in the book of Revelation, you can take the same thing, and each vision will work toward the end of that same, same end times that the book of Daniel does. So as I kind of tried to lay you out an example there in the first couple of paragraphs of how the different visions in Daniel relate, but yet each one has its own peculiar uh, uh, information uh, to add to the vision, the overall vision, so that same pattern is picked up in the book of Revelation. And it, uh, it to have that understanding, uh, it brings light to the chronology and the fullness of the predicted occurrences. So, for example, in the book of Revelation, chapters 1 through 3 is the introduction of the revelation of things to come to pass with a view towards His coming. In Revelation chapter 1, when you read what Christ said when He was giving the revelation, His revelation and letting John see it. In the seventh verse, after he reveals himself, he says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. All right, so in Revelation chapter 1, we know what follows, chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we know that in chapter 2 and 3, it, it's addressed to the churches, the seven representative churches, right? But Christ, from the first chapter, reveals the overall end game of, of all of what he's about to show in things to come. He's, he jumps right to the end, to the conclusion, in the seventh verse of Revelation chapter 1, doesn't he? 
Okay, he doesn't pick up right there and at in chapter seven and, and tell you everything that's related to that end of prophecy. The end. He 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 actually just starts talking about those that will qualify in and for the the glory that he will present himself in. He then goes on, instead of talking specifics about the prophecies, about the prophecy he's about to show John, he starts talking about how to overcome that you might have a part in it. Are you with me? What am I talking about? I'm talking about how in prophecy that it, there will be an overall purpose of the vision stated and then in the, the visions or the words that follow, then they revert back to that original uh, expressed intent of the prophecy and fill it up with more detail and meaning. So from the first chapter of Revelation, we get the end. Christ says in the seventh verse, what's going to happen? I'm going to come back in, in glory. I'm gone now. No one sees me. Uh, and no one will see me for many days. And, but I am coming back. And I'm coming back in the clouds, into the heavens. Every eye on the whole earth is going to see me. Even those Jews that pierced me. Specifically, those Jews that pierced me. In other words, he's, he's saying, he's filling up the meaning of Daniel chapter 2, the stone. He's filling up the meaning of chapter 7. Where he's the ancient, who, who is appointed by the ancient of days, the prince that receives the whole kingdom. He's pointing back in the seventh verse of the first chapter, back to all of those words that are spoken about of him, Zechariah, chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, you, as I said, you move forward from the second chapter of Revelation into chapters 2 and 3, and you start realizing that after this initial introduction, he passes on toward how, what will transpire between then, the day he gave this vision, to John and his coming back some 2,000 years later. And then the overcomers in the church, how and what it is that they'll be receiving as their inheritance in the ruling with Christ in that kingdom when he returns if they're faithful. There was a great deal of understanding in the Jewish community as to what the kingdom was about. And in, in, their, in the Jewish community, of course, it meant that the Messiah was going to reestablish Israel and the earth as the predominant, preeminent nation of God, the intermediate nation of God between the Gentiles and God. And so there was a great amount of understanding of understanding when the kingdom comes, when the kingdom is restored, when the Messiah comes. And Christ filled the words of inheritance up as to what it means to inherit in Christ in the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation. What is it? What does it mean to be in me and me come back and all nations see me and all well? What does it mean for me to come back in glory and establish my kingdom to you? Well, this is what it means. 
And then the second and third chapter, he explains to those who are qualified or are qualifying as overcomers. And it is those promises of that, of those things that accompany the inheritance of the overcomer in Christ in his kingdom that are laid out in the second and the third chapter of Revelation. The next, uh, the next revealing of in the vision begins in the fourth chapter, the first verse. The next seven seals that begin at his investiture as the king of kings carry through the events of chapter 7. What? When you read the seven seals and you read oh, what, though, what time frame that those seven seals uh, comp- encompass, you discover that the seven seals takes us into the eighth chapter, into the first verse of Revelation. Let's just turn to Revelation chapter 7. And we'll think, I don't want anybody to lose thought, uh, the thought of where, what I'm trying to show you. The thought I'm trying to show you is this pattern of how th- that will help us understand and comprehend the book, the way the book of Revelation is laid out for us. We need to understand this pattern that where God gives us a portion or a part in one vision and he adds to it uh, it, more information in the next vision, more detail. And they don't necessarily, uh, they aren't necessarily uh, consecutive. He may talk talk about something in in the next vision that, that happens later or it might happen early, it might have happened earlier. And that's why I'm trying. I'm going to try to lay this out in a simple way. I don't know if there's a simple way, but I'm going to try. That's what I prayed for. I said, "Lord, help me, help me express this idea, this thought, this pattern, this understanding, simply, where we can just grasp it." And so that's what I'm attempting to do: is to speak out, speak something, and show you something that you can get a hold of and say, "Aha! I get it. I understand that." Okay. And so when I say that we started out in this way, Jesus revealed us. He's getting ready to show a lot of things, isn't he? I mean, he's showing showing his revelation. The whole book is about his revelation. But he doesn't just start verse 1 and then and go from the very that moment and then try to explain it from there forward uh, chronologically. Uh, and so we have to comprehend how it is that he has given prophecy as it relates to end time. And the book of Daniel is a perfect pattern. And we'll be able to discern it as we move through it if we can comprehend the, the pattern in which he gave this end time prophecy. So he comes forth in the first chapter and the second and third chapter and he lays it out. And then the next thing that occurs, the next feature, you could say, is the seven seals. And so we have in, in Scripture, then, we have the fourth, actually the sixth, we have the sixth and the seventh chapter, some of the fifth, sixth, and seventh chapter, we have a, a laying out and an opening of, of seals, these seven seals. So what time frame those seven seals represent, uh, what events they represent, uh, through, they, is through or are through the eighth chapter, the first verse, and when he opened the seventh seal. So we could say that the seven seals deal, are dealt with in these first eight chapters. The next 
Well, let's just see what that would include. Well, what that would include is, let's say, let's pick up in the 13th chapter of chapter, uh, 13th verse of chapter 7, Revelation. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came thee? Or whence came they? And I, I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes. So, in the 14th verse of the 7th chapter, we have a glimpse of, of that time. Let's call this the seven year period, all right? I guess I could do it down here. Here's the seven year period. We have a glimpse of the time that that takes us to near the end of this is his second coming. This is the second coming of Christ. This this, this represents the second coming. This is the end. This is the end of the 70th week. So, we have a glimpse in chapter 7, verse 14, that places us right here. Right toward the end of the tribulation. Because it says... Sir, thou knowest, and he said to me, these are they which came out of the great tribulation. So in the vision, in the seals, if you go back to the, the 12th verse of chapter 6, and I beheld when he had opened the 6th seal. So from the 6th chapter, the 12th verse, in the opening of the 6th seal, and then unto the 7th seal, opened in the 8th chapter, in the 1st verse, we have a vision, and this vision included a view of those dressed in white, those overcomers who are gathered together with Christ in the heavenly realm, washed with white, in white robes, washed in the blood of the Lamb. So here, we'll say at the First of the vision, right? This is, this is just a line that represents the, the, the vision given to John. So we're, we're at the beginning of Christ revealing the vision, the fullness of the vision to John. But yet, in the beginning here, he's discussing or showing him Something that transpires at the end, near the end of the tribulation, prior to his second coming. So, he taught, he speaks of the seals. He speaks of the seals in the, in the very beginning of the vision. And the seals in themselves take us to a point that is right before his second what we coming. Want, we, what we want to do is we want to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. First seal, second seal, third seal, fourth, and then we want to see it on a chronological, uh, in chronological order on a timeline. And you're not going to be able to see it that way because it's not given that way. And neither was Daniel. Uh, that's what my whole point was to show you how it was that God kept coming back to that first vision. I'm going to show you how the book of Revelation keeps coming back to first uh, verse or chapter one, verse seven. I mean, in actuality, because he gave it the end. I'm coming back. They're all are going to see me. And, and now he's going to add parts and he's going to. But it's all going to point to the same terminus. It's all pointing here. Second coming and establishing of his kingdom. But it's not given in chronological order. So I'm tr trying to show you that. And then. Uh, how how practically that, that that's seen by just 
common sense uh, understanding of spiritual uh, spiritual principle. Yeah, it is, and that that's in languages, and this is in prophecy. This is the way God has given prophecy. This is the way He gave it. And I want. I hope that I give you enough without going into great detail in Daniel to give you an example of how it was that in all the visions of Daniel and the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, how it was that God referred back that the first one was the pattern for all of them. They weren't, they weren't different. They were all the same, about the same, the same terminus, the same thing, which is Christ coming back and establishing the kingdom. To Daniel, it was all about you know the Jews being established in the land and coming into that kingdom with a kingdom of the Messiah. And so it is in the book of Revelation, it's the very same way. He gives a series of consecutive visions that, in our mind, bounce all over the place. And that's why there's been so much confusion, is because there is a, a lack of understanding the principle, and then, of course, trying to tie your already... Uh, polarized denominational view into what it is that you're looking at, which just skews the whole thing even worse. So when you're, you are personally looking at the book of Revelation and you have this understanding of how God gives prophecy, then it's going to really enhance your ability to comprehend what it is that he's doing. And it's really not that difficult once you get some basics down, I'm surprised how much there's not been a book, I guess, maybe Daniel, that's been written about more, but it has so worthless. So worthless. I mean, there's so much to do about something, but it's so worthless in what we've gotten. Just over and over, there's ex- expositions. Uh, of, of prophecy in the book of Revelation that are unbelievable. They're just they're just fanciful. They're ridiculous. They're not. They don't, they don't have yet an, an ounce of truth in them. And there's and there's just thousands of them. It's not just one or two or a few. That matter of fact, you can't go sort through all them to find something that really has has some truth in it. So this is one, this is maybe the, but it's certainly one of the keys to comprehending the book of Revelation. So I'm talking about the seals and trying to give you an example that, that, that how the, the, the seals themselves are, are, are taken all the way to Christ. Uh, the first fruits offering and the bride of Christ. It's take the seventh seals uh, take you there. You can't stop. You can't think of them in terms of well, the seven seals were before the first three and a half year period. That you're never going to get it if you if that's the way you think. You're going to have to think well, the seven seals go could extend all the way at least until the return of Christ. And what you're going to find out is so do the trumpets. And the trumpets actually extend beyond the coming of Christ. It goes beyond to the kingdom of God, given up to the kingdom of God. Let me, let, me, let me explain that to you. The trumpets begin also at the time of the Lamb's investiture. All right, I'm, I'm taking some things for granted, and that is that you'll recall that we're going to place... Christ's investiture. I may not get through the lesson, but whatever I do get through, I want it to make some sense. And and I feel sorry for those online that have to try to, to get it. Uh, <laughs> they just want to come and listen to a few minutes and try to get it because they're not going to get it. So Christ's investiture, where is it? He is the Lamb of God who is being who is receiving what is His. King, uh, King of Kings. This begins in the fourth chapter of Revelation, verses one and two, 
the setting up of the throne, which is the same as Daniel's uh, seventh chapter of the setting up of the throne, the setting up of the throne, it is there that, that at that investiture that, that takes place, begins here in Revelation. What did I write? Why did I write one, two there? What am I, what am I referencing? I don't know. Yeah, that's right, four, one and two. So Revelation 4, 1 and 2, his investiture goes clean to to his second coming, doesn't it? I mean, he's not really invested as king of kings. He doesn't really come into his kingdom until his second coming. So in Revelation 4, 1, his investiture begins... The ceremony begins, the seals begin, the trumpets begin, because it's the beginning of the, tra- of, of the investiture. The seven trumpets begin here at his investiture, at a point in his investiture, and they carry through and they go beyond. This is supposed to be millennium. They go beyond the millennium, the end of the millennium. This is the end of millennium. The seventh angel begins sounding. Jerry gets it. it you know, the seventh trumpet isn't, doot, you know, and that's, that's the end of it. The seventh trump is, right? So, what is this? Whatever, they, whatever they call it. Anyway, the, the point is that the, the, the seventh trump, even there's six trumps, and then the seventh trump carries on till here, to the end of the millennium. The time that is encompassed within the seventh trump extends all the way until the kingdom becomes the kingdom of God. Revelation 11.15. If you look at Revelation 11.15... And the seventh angel sounded, or begun to sound. And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kings of of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. When you take that scripture and you tie it back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you discover that all things are under Christ until the end of the millennium when Christ lays all at the feet of, of God. So that's that we're we're going to see that that the trumpets are something are, are representing of some judgments that that run the full length of the time of the 70th week of Daniel plus. And then and then after we have the seals and then we have the trumpets, then we have Revelation uh, chapter 12, 12, 13, and 14. Uh, chapter 12 begins with and relates the birth of the man-child caught away to the throne. That is, appointed to reign with Christ. I don't know how much of this to repeat because because I don't know how much you remember. <laughs> but you'll, you should recall that in the fifth verse of the Revelation, chapter 12, we'll find the man-child is caught up, brought up to reign, and is to rule the nations with a rod of iron. So, he's caught, so we know who that is from the promises, uh, the overcoming promises in the second and the third chapter of Revelation in that it is a promise to his overcomers, to the bride, that they would rule with a rod of iron. So in chapter 12, we have a the birth or the catching away of the man-child to the throne that is appointed to reign with Christ. At a certain point after his investiture, at which time that Satan is cast out of the first heaven down to the earth 
when he then brings up the Antichrist from the pit in his authority. In Satan's authority. So don't don't get too worried. I'm gonna we're gonna speak. I'm giving the bones of something, right? And then I'll put some meat on it. All right. We're talking about a understanding, a concept of a pattern of a way that the Lord gives uh, the prophecy through consecutive visions. How how He does that? How they there are parts of the vision that end up, they all end up the same terminus, but they have different ways of getting there. So we're speaking about the 12th chapter at the moment, and in the 12th chapter there are some events. One of the events is the man-child is caught up. That's the faithful living overcomers or the first fruits or what we have understood uh, to some degree, as the rapture. It's not the rapture that is understood in Christendom, but it is a rapture. Because there's more than one rapture, so it's not the rapture, it's a rapture. A rapture transpires during the tribulation, during the last week of Daniel, the 70th week of Daniel, it occurs in this timeline in this seven-year period, and it, 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 at the same time in the 12th chapter, we discover not only this catching away, but a casting down, right? In the 12th chapter, there's a catching up of the man-child, but a casting down of Satan and his angels at that same time, whatever that time is. And at that time, we understand from Scripture that that the Antichrist is brought up from the pit or from Hades. This is presented to us in chapter 13. And then this portion of the vision that, that is the 12th, 13th, and 14th, chapters, ends with the destruction of the Antichrist in chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. So from the beginning of the 12th chapter to the end of the 14th chapter is consecutive time with with events in it that all represent these things. The catching up of the man-child the casting down of the devil from the heavens, the bringing up from Hades, the Antichrist, the establishing of his kingdom, and then the final destruction of him him and his kingdom in the 20th, I believe, the 20th and 21st verse of the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. So 12th, 13th, 14th chapter of the book of Revelation are all parenthetical. Parenthetical. Meaning, let's just do another line here. I don't know if these lines are helpful to you guys or not, but let's just place it for the sake of talking about this pattern that we're trying to establish. The 12th and the 14th chapter, let's say they happen here in a timeline of seven years. All right. <clears throat> the twelfth chapter speaks of some events. And the twelfth chapter then points backwards to things that happened previously in that seven year period. And then it speaks also of things that happened during that time. And then in the 13th chapter and the 14th chapter, they also speak of things prior to the 12th chapter, such as, as example, Revelation chapter 9, verse 1, is a reference to the time frame when Satan is cast down. 
it points back and is described in the thir- uh, ninth chapter of Revelation. And then the 14th chapter speaks in terms of things that transpire throughout the last three and a half year period all the way to the final wine press of God, wrath, wherein is the destruction of the Antichrist and his and Christ's enemies. So the 12th or 13th and 14th chapters are parenthetical and they are they are speaking about things prior and after the uh, in the seven year period. Things happen before the seven, at the beginning, toward the beginning of the seven year period, and then things that happen toward the, uh, along the way in the second half of the seven year period and at the end of the seven year period. So it's the same principle, if you think about it, that that is seen in the book of Daniel, when when the book uh, when Daniel's visions sometimes pointed back to to some things, and sometimes they pointed forward. So putting the next uh, set of events into the 15th chapter. So we had the trumpets, and then we have the 12th, 13th, 14th chapter. Uh, yes, ma'am. I forgot, yeah, I forgot you raised your hand a while ago. Why would you ask me that question right here? In your mind, or in some the 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 answer is yes and no. The answer is, yeah. You're always you're always going to be safe if you say yes and no. There is a as I said, there's a great deal of 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 word of God that points toward and speaks of the Syrian. The Assyrian. The book of Isaiah is full of it. The great Assyrian. And the types there uh, are, and, and not only there, but in Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, there are, there are allusions to, um, uh, to who, who you could potentially say is, is from where he comes from. Not necessarily what nationality would be, but that's presumed. But to, to the locale of where he comes from is not London, and it's not New York. Uh, and it's, it's, based, it's, based, it's based upon the Word of God. You can take it and you can, uh, you can narrow down the field as to who it is, by taking the word of God and just item line item where when and who I'm not talking about uh, I'm not talking about a person you know I'm not talking about a person that lives I'm not talking about a person that lives I'm talking about a person that has lived and most Christian looks for somebody who lives. And that's where they stumble in the Word of God. And they don't understand that from the pit means from the pit. The, the 13th chapter, uh, which we're now speaking of, clearly says, and the 11th chapter, says he comes from the pit. The Antichrist comes out of Hades. So it is someone who has lived. So whether they are a Jew or not is open for discussion. Uh, there are some that would say it's this person or that person. But to be looking or pointing a finger at, you know, somebody on the earth is to miss the point of the scriptures in, in the resurrection or the, re, uh, the revitalizing of a person who has been living. So you can find that in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation, which is a, 
as I say, it's a parenthetical insertion. So, so God go, uh, is talking along, he's speaking along in terms of the Antichrist in the verse 7 of chapter 11. If we're going to get off, let's just get off. 7.11, it says, And when they shall have finished their testimony, who is that? The two witnesses. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Right? So that's in the 11th chapter, in the 7th verse. It, it, right there would have been a good time for the Lord to talk about this Antichrist. <laughs> Instead, he goes... Still forward, the Spirit goes forward two more chapters to get to chapter 13 before He lays out to us the Antichrist. Who gave Him authority? Where has He come from? Etc. So that's a perfect example how you're reading along, you have the introduction to a subject in one portion of a vision. That The subject being introduced is twofold. Two witnesses who are killed by... And a beast who came out of the bottomless pit, the real place, the abyss. And then it goes on and speaks in terms of the witnesses, two witnesses. But then it goes, the Bible will pick back up in the 13th chapter and, and give us all the detail of what, who that was in the 11th chapter. And therefore, it's parenthetical. It's an insertion. It's speaking about something that not not in that time that it's speaking of. We're discussing Revelations. I had a pretty tough week in D.C. on different things. And she was saying, well, Billy Graham and her father said he was Jewish. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, yeah, so. <laughs> 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 I said, you said, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a Syrian. Like, what? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not dogmatic about who it is, but I'm dogmatic about knowing where he comes from. <laughs> and and <clears throat> I know where he comes from, and let's, get, let's have that established first. And it, it'll stop a lot of speculation if you can... If you can establish the, and you can, and you establish more than that, you establish the fact that the word of God can be taken literally, wherever that it, it is not absurd. And it's not absurd to believe that one comes out of Hades to back to life, unless you call Christ's resurrection absurd. And then, if you call Christ's resurrection absurd, then we can call the idea that the Antichrist comes from Hades absurd. So on those on that ground uh, that the the word of God has set precedent uh, as to what absurd is, then we know that we can take it literally, and it doesn't occur one time, but at least twice is there a reference to just the Antichrist coming from the abyss or the bottomless pit. Then we have, of course, the additional word, lest it be mistaken that it was a typo or a shadow or something, we have the false prophet coming from the very same place. But back to my point of trying to establish the pattern of the principle of this. <clears throat> I think you already got it intuitively. You get it. I mean, you get it, what I'm trying to establish here. Because it, it's so important to have that pattern laid out in your mind <clears throat> as, as to... Uh, the general principles uh, of each of these events or, or parts of the vision of John. So <clears throat> what I will suggest, if I want to say that chapters 12, 13, and 14 are parenthetical, I need to tell you where, where they are inserted parenthetically. Well, I'm talking about <clears throat> in the chronology of things. The 11th chapter and the 15th verse is where it, it is inserted and then where it's picked up again 
is the 15th chapter in the first verse. So you have the 11th chapter in the 15th verse. Then you have the parenthetical, 12th, 13th, 14th chapter that, that give you information about things prior to 11, chapter 11, and give you things about things that are post uh, chapter 14. So they go, if you're going to draw lines, which I have done, and it, it gets a little complicated, it gets a little sophisticated, it gets a little, you know, I don't want to say that, it gets, uh, it gets difficult to follow if I was to draw it for you. All of the lines as to what each uh, reference in 12, 13, and 14, where it goes. Well, where does that go? Well, that goes here. Where does that go? Well, that goes here. And it's forward and backward. But I'm not trying to, to teach on that. I'm just trying to teach here the principle so that now you can, as you read, you can put the pieces together. You can connect the dots. So then you know, we've talked through the 14th chapter. We've gotten to the 15th chapter. Revelation chapter 15 picks up in the period of the last trumpet of chapter 11, 19. That chapter 11, 19 being the same event of 15, 1. Are you with me? What did I just say? 11, 19 is 15, 1. That's the same thing. That's why the other is parenthetical. <laughs> Because it's the same at the beginning at 11.19 or the end of 11.19 and the beginning of 15.1. They're the same. It's the same gathering. In the temple of God was opened in heaven. There was seen in this temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So you pick that up in the 15th and first verse. And I saw another sign in heaven, great marvelous seven angels having the seven plagues. For in them is filled the wrath of God. And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. In other words, heaven is opened up and, he, and, and the vision is, is uh, of this heavenly area uh, that carries on then in the 15th chapter of the first verse. <clears throat> and it carries on to the 16th chapter uh, being the same event of 15.1, the seven. They're the, they're the seven last plagues are introduced to us in the 15th chapter, uh, the vials. And then they're poured out in the 16th chapter. So we had the seals, the trumpets, and now the vials. And through the 16th chapter, uh, we had the, we had, we're beginning in the 15th chapter, we have the introduction of the vials, and then the 16th chapter, the pouring out of the vials. And then what ends it, where it ends up at in the 16th chapter is the battle of the Armageddon and the destruction of the city of Babylon. So where does that take us again? Uh, you know, I've got a circle and an X. But when we, if we read the 15th and the 16th chapter, it will take us to the terminus or the second coming of Christ because you'll have in this time frame, you're going to have these seven vials these seven vials of the 15th chapter in the, uh, happen, and then at the 16th chapter, you're going to see that God remembers Babylon, and he, he destroys Babylon at the same time of the Battle of Armageddon. Read the 16th chapter, you'll see that are the great, that, that, that besides the vials are, are the, the great two events of the 16th chapter. Well, of course, the vials tie, tie to the judgments of the of Babylon and Armageddon. So the 15th and 16th chapter, beginning with the vials, which happens sometime in the last seven or last three and a half years of the seven year period, and they terminate or they finish with the second coming of Christ. Yes. that it will be heard echoed around the world right in that one I just wanted to mention that yeah I mean, it, it meaning significant to the whole world the, the seventh trump is is climactic in that it does usher in 
as it says in 11.19 or 11.15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of the world... are become the kingdoms of our Lord. So that's, at, that's at, at the sounding of the seventh trump. You have, during that sounding of the seventh trump, you have the revelation, you have the manifestation. Again, this is the 11th chapter. If we were listening to them out, and where's the terminus again? The terminus is right here, the second coming of Christ. We just read it. The 15th verse of chapter 11 the terminus is the second coming of Christ, the blowing of the seventh trump, the sound that's heard all around the whole world. When the kingdoms, the kingdoms of the earth, the, the goyim, the, all those four empires, all the second chapter of Nebuchadnezzar's dream have culminated and finished right here with the 15th verse of the 11th chapter, the seventh trump which begins that kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of the Messiah. <clears throat> I don't mind any of those comments or thoughts or questions because all I'm trying to do is get you more familiar with the book of Revelation. Because we want to understand by the help of the Lord, there's no other way to understand it, the book and and, and, and more importantly, that we experience the blessing of the first chapter of that book in that God has a special blessing, and I'm going to get to what that blessing is, for those who, who hear, comprehend, and do uh, that that's represented in that book. So that's where we're at. I want God to move our hearts. You know what? If we could actually see what it is that God's doing with clarity, it's going to change our hearts. It's going to change our whole comprehension. Who said what? Who made the prayer about the Word of God? And it was Jim in Jim's prayer. He was praying about the Word of God. And we come to hear the Word of God and change according to the Word of God. So that's, that's the exercise here. This is not for any other purpose. So any of those comments that help you uh, locate the chronology and the events in the book of Revelation is going to, if it's going to help you, then let, that's the whole exercise, so let's stop and do it. So the, 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 the examples I've been laying forth before you bring us to, through the 16th chapter. And chapter 17 turns back to the beginning of the reign of terror over the world. What? I said the 17th chapter turns us back. So let's, the 17th chapter, uh, <laughs> I could have so many lines here. The 17th chapter, let me just do it with, with a verbal image. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll do that. So the, se the 17th chapter is is something that happens toward the middle of the seven-year period, the 70th week of Daniel. It's toward the middle. It is, it, it's, the 17th chapter is toward the end of the book of Revelation, but it takes us back to an event toward the middle of the tribulation period, which is the destruction of Rome. And we'll, we'll talk about the, the purpose, the reasoning behind that in a minute, but just knowing that the 17th chapter turns back to the beginning of the reign of terror of the Antichrist over the world with the destruction of the city, Rome, and pretentious Christianity. So then, that's an event. That's an event. And it's, it happened somewhere in that seven-year period. Would we all agree on that, wouldn't we? So chronologically, we, we understand uh, <clears throat> from, from further examination of the word that it comes at the beginning of the reign of terror by the Antichrist. Because up until then, 
the mystic Babylon rides on the back of the Antichrist until he comes into his reign. When he's still finessing it, he's still using other, by other means, stealth, blasphemous, treachery, flattery. He's making his way. He's carrying on his back blasphemous, hypocritical, pretentious Christianity. But when he is finished with that, no need no more for any of that other pretense on his own on his part, he casts her off his back. That is at the beginning, according to the scriptures, if you lay them out, of his reign of terror. So the 17th chapter points us here, and it's a full description of what happens to Rome. Whereas the 18th chapter now, the 18th chapter points us forward. We already discussed it. The 18th chapter, I mean, it's a difficulty with my markers, being the what? This, that's right, the fall of Babylon. The 18th chapter is the fall of Babylon, which is listed out in the 16th chapter in the last, I think the 19th verse, or right around there. It's listed out as God remembering, yeah, it's 19, God remembering Babylon. Do you remember? <laughs> Do you remember us talking and teaching about it? So the, the 17th chapter is the destruction of Rome toward the middle of the three and a half period. It is not until God pours out the what, what vial? What, what's the number of the vial on the, on the, uh, on the destruction of the city of Babylon? What's the number of the vial? City of Babylon. Seventh. So you have the seventh vial. That's the end, isn't it? Isn't the seventh vial the end? That's the end of the judgments, the plagues of God. It corresponds with the seventh trumpet. Of course, it precedes the seventh trumpet, but it's at this basically the same time. When the seventh vial comes at, uh, down, then we have the destruction of Babylon literal, the city uh, of Babylon. That's the 18th chapter. That's at the end of his reign. So at the beginning of Antichrist's reign is the destruction of blasphemous, hypocritical, pretentious Christianity. At the end of his reign comes the destruction of his home city, his base. And, and that's, that's why I'm a little bit Vague, Kathy, on the nationality of the Antichrist. Yeah, because when you go back and you look at history, some of these nations encompassed the full body of the Middle East. So, you know, an Assyrian in 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 the one part, the first prophets time frame was something different from the latter prophets because it is a larger area. It went from this area to this area. So when, it, when we have the description of the Antichrist brought to our attention in Daniel and other places, it, it uh, leaves a little question as to uh, at what time frame uh, and then what what chronological or what um, topographical, is that the right word? That one locale, geographical, geographical location of that of that person. 
I have an opinion on that, but I'm just saying. Would only accept him if he was Jewish, and I was saying, well, the rest of the world would accept him if he was Jewish. <laughs> yeah, Wouldn't the whole premise be because he has been resurrected that that's going to be like a miracle, and people yeah. are going to yeah. like be drawn to that? Yes. And it's not going to be not necessarily his nationality, right. but be the yeah. event. Yeah. It's not going to be status quo. Yeah, the, we're talking about. Of um, amazing events here. We're talking about things that are going to change the dynamics of of the way things are, the way people way people think. You know, as the wind blows, not not not, and I say that about Israel, the leadership of Israel. I say that about the leadership of Christianity. As the wind blows, if it if it behooves them, if it's financially. Uh, uh, to their advantage, is you're you're going to find a lot of of uh, hypocrisy. So wh- wh- who will they accept? They'll accept somebody that allows them to survive. That's who they'll accept. It was the reason that they were afraid to receive Christ. They wouldn't receive Christ, not because he didn't fulfill the scriptures, but because he threatened their lives as from a Roman perspective. We like things like they are. That's what Christ said. You receive somebody. Uh, I came in his name, the Lord's name. And now you'll receive somebody that comes in his own name. Why? Because the table is turned. It's beneficial to them then. It's not threatening to them then. So move, I keep getting away there. The, uh, so the chapters then 19 through 26 picks up with the first fruits and the harvest gatherings of the first resurrection. And that's kind of how I got off on this when we were when we read Daniel 12, 1 and 2. We, I, I said that what 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 we could what we were brought to we were brought to the first resurrection. The time of troubles like never before from when there was a nation to then or till now. Then, at the end of that time of trouble like never before, Daniel spoke of the first resurrection. So chapter 19 through 26 picks up with the first fruits and the harvest gatherings of the first resurrection and now together are raised up into the first heavens with the bridegroom and ends his investiture as king of kings in the destruction of of his enemies. So the 19th and the 20th chapter terminus again brings us back here to the second coming of Christ. Now Christ's investiture has taken its full, it's now been completed because now he does come back and he established himself as king of kings in his kingdom, millennial kingdom. So 19th and 20th chapters takes us to the end uh, of the seven-year period. Are you with me? 19th and the 20th chapter brings us to the end of the 70th week of Daniel, the last three and a half years, that are spoken of in in more depth in the 14th chapter of Revelation. So the the 14th chapter of Revelation, almost all of the 14th chapter of Revelation, points toward the first fruits and harvests of those of the first resurrection. Chapter 19 and 20 gives gives a a description of the events happening and they're in chapter 14 they are typed in the agricultural example set before us. Okay, I took forever to get there and I don't feel like I, you know, I feel like I've spoken for an hour and haven't said anything. I hate that. I hope that I'm saying more than I think I am. I hope you're getting more than I'm 
saying. So uh, the 19th and the 20th chapter through the 6th verse are establishing the uh, the destruction of the enemies of Christ and the establishing of the thrones of His bride in His kingdom. That of the first heavens above and the earth below. Now you, you all are familiar with that scripture I said 4 through 20 uh, verse 6 and 20 verse Six is not what I intended, is it? Twenty, nineteen, chapter nineteen, yeah, yeah, it is twenty four through six. And four says, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded, the witnesses of Jesus, and for the word of some God. In other words, we're talking about, in verse 6, blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. So that ties us back to our lesson in the second verse of chapter 12 of Daniel, where it speaks exclusively of this first resurrection. That's what Daniel was seeing in his vision was the same things that John was seeing in his vision. They correspond to the same time. There's only one first resurrection. <laughs> and Thus, this book of Daniel and the visions of John are so that they connect. Though they start at different points, cover some of the same events, giving new and more detailed information, but all then proceeding to that same climactic point. So, Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. I read it already. And at that, but I didn't read verse 3. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of the people, and there, thy people, David, uh, Daniel. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in that book or in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be, that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up thy words, or seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and acknowledge shall be increased. Well, I guess I'm going to stop and just make a comment about that, about the, the way that, that that's uh, uh, worded and what's interpreted. I've done some homework on, on that, and just to boil it down, the real sense of that statement of knowledge shall be increased it is many shall pursue the book. What book? The book that, that is here. Finished. It's finished. It's complete. It's whole. It's sealed up. Many at the end times will pursue this book. Another translation, many shall diligently investigate. And the Tregales, who I, as many of you know, I really like, have a lot of respect for, says many shall scrutinize the book from end to end. Many shall scrutinize the book, the book of Daniel, end to end. The book of prophecy of the end times from end to end. So, the point being, knowledge of it uh, shall be increased in the end times. 
knowledge of end time, Daniel, the book of Daniel, shall be increased in the end time. Now I know, and I've said it myself, that that the uh, knowledge being increased in the latter days is also applicable to the to the world. Uh, certainly, there is that has got to be a part of the strategy of the world. Is is the the appeal of the world? And there's many appeals in the in e- every arena. You take an arena, you know, whether it be social or religious or financial or whatever, governmental, and whatever you find, whatever sphere you can find, you're going to find that knowledge will be increased in all those spheres in, as, as the end times approach. But to, to interpret this word as God intended it is to understand that the knowledge of this book that's been finished here, stop right here, Daniel, Right here is enough. This is what what will will do the job. For in the end time, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro. The understanding of that is many shall pursue uh, not the knowledge, and and it, it will be increased. Knowledge and knowledge shall be increased. Do you think pursuit will bring increase in knowledge? That's the Word of God. <laughs> Study yourself, show yourself. Yeah, the whole Word of God points toward what, what about Daniel? What, what was his intent? It, he was pursuing. You know, I couldn't help but think about uh, Paul when I when I was meditating on these, on this, on this particular verse, and on these first two and three verses of Daniel 12, I just couldn't help thinking of Paul because I, the most beautiful prayer in the whole Bible, I think, is found in the third chapter of Philippians. And it has to do with Paul praying that he might be found a part of this first resurrection. And it is this then that Paul had in view when he was praying. He had understood the dynamic here. And he wrote, this one thing I do in Philippians chapter 3, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And how did he, how did he uh, proof up? what he just wrote. He proofed it up by setting aside all those great achievements and the knowledge of, that he had gained in this world. He set aside all the gain and the glory that he might obtain the more excellent knowledge and, and thereby obtain the prize of Christ, Jesus his Lord. That is to say, that I might know him and the power of, of his resurrection. To know him is to empower oneself in newness of life. Romans chapter 6. Paul's prayer is that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. That is to say, by entering into the fellowship of his sufferings. by and in the power of Christ's resurrection, and thereby serving Him and denying any self-promoting, and that faithfully, and that doing faithfully until the day I die. My hope is then, my hope is in then having been made conformable unto His death. In the humility of Christ's death, I would be associated with it. I, I in, the, in the last, in the epitaph, in the last moment of my life, it should be said of me that I was conformed unto his death, that if by any means I might attain unto the first out resurrection of or from among the dead. 
So it is, my mind went to Paul. I, I meant to spend about a half a page talking about that. <clears throat> and as I kept going, I decided against it because I was going to lose the whole train of thought of Daniel chapter 12. Uh, and so I, I left it there and I thought, well, I'm going to bring it out uh, and let and let, uh, and let you, uh, let the Lord speak to you accordingly. So this great deliverance that is alluded to, uh, thy people shall be delivered after this great trouble, right? The first, first verse. The peop- this deliverance that he, he, Daniel, alludes to is miraculous at that time. At that time is the beginning of the first verse of chapter 12. What is that time? Just before Israel is delivered. Many shall awake. Uh, That literally means to be separated out from among the sleepers in the earth dust. These who awake at that time shall be unto everlasting life. But those who do not awake at that time shall be unto shame and everlasting contempt. That's the, that's the twinkling of an eye is the changing of those that are alive. The, the 16th chapter, I think 33rd verse of First Corinthians. That's those that are alive are changed in the twinkling of an eye from corruptible to incorruptible. What is being said here is differentiating between the first resurrection and the second resurrection. So there is a thousand years in the difference uh, in this one uh, sentence. The first resurrection, they will be raised up in glory and they, they shall ever have everlasting glorious life, life more abundantly. But those that do not awake at that time, they will lay I always say lay because he always uses technically it's it's not but those that stay in the in the earth stay in the intermediate place of the dead shall be shamed and have everlasting contempt a simultaneous resurrection of all mankind good and bad is not taught in the scriptures it's the resurrection of all holy and of Israel's holy dead that are here prophesied of. It isn't until after the millennium that we have the great white throne judgment. After the millennium, here we have the great white throne judgment, great white throne judgment. It is then that the remainder of those that are in Hades, the center of the earth, whatever compartment they might be in, it is at that time that the remainder are caught up and judged at the great white throne judgment. It is this first resurrection that we speak to here just that just precedes The second coming of the Lord. That's the first resurrection. Blessed are you, if you have a part in the first resurrection, for the second death has no no part. You have no part in the second death. That's the way it goes on to say in the sixth verse of the 20th chapter. Implying that if you are in the second resurrection, you are subject to the second death. Same words of Christ in the second or the third chapter of Revelation. I will keep you from the second death. So the first resurrection is the one, the point is the first resurrection is the one that, that Daniel chapter 1, uh, chapter 12 verses 1, 2, and 3 are uh, are speaking of. 
and It is the first resurrection, Revelation 20, 3 through 6, the out-resurrection. That's the same thing that Christ said in, in Luke, I believe, chapter 20. Is that right? Luke 20 or Matthew 20. Anyway, he, he is response to those that question him about whose wife is she, since she had been married to six or seven of them. Whose wife in the resurrection is she? You don't know the power of God nor the word of God. And she's not, he goes on to say, she's not, she will not be anybody's wife in the, in the resurrection out from among the dead. Those that are privileged, he said, those that are honored, those that are a part of, or those that are included in the first resurrection will be like an unto the angels are not giving and taking in marriage. It is the word out from among the dead that should let you know that it's the first resurrection. Out from among them. The second resurrection is the remainder. It's all those that remained in, the, in Hades. It's the same way in Th Philippians chapter 3, the verse I just read, I believe it's the 11th verse, Lord, I just spoke to you about Paul, that I might be a, my, the prize, the high prize of the calling of Jesus Christ is to be found a part of the first resurrection. And it's the same words there, out from among the dead, out from among those that are in Hades. So it, the out resurrection is the first resurrection. The second resurrection is the remaining of those in, in Hades. Of course, for any of that to resonate with anybody, you have to believe that that's where you go when you die. So with that, but this is not a lesson on that. If you want that lesson, I've got plenty of lessons online. We're going to take for granted that you will, you do understand that that's where we go. That's where Paul went. That's where Paul is. He's in Hades. The hour when Old and New Testament saints are together made perfect, both raised from their graves by the voice of the Son of God. Hebrews 11, 35, and 40. It is the time point of the second coming for the salvation of the righteous and the destruction of the wicked. Even as the one time point, Noah and his family entered into the ark, and then the rain began, right? And then it began to fall, and the ungodly perished in the flood. When the first resurrection are caught up, the dead first, and then those that are living, at the harvest, right before the second coming of Christ, you're, you, will, you can take that to the type of Noah being shut up in the ark. Now... The seventh plague, representative of the flood, the just, the justice of God on the rest of the earth, transpires. So great is this greatest of all time points in history of the world when the Jews are restored and Gentile politics and power are destroyed and the holy dead are waked from their graves or brought up from the graves. I don't like the word waked, although... It's an impression that is given. Because they're alert. They're awake already, aren't they? We don't need to go there. The resurrection of the saints out of Hades, the intermediate place of the dead, is placed at no other age than the close of the tribulation great. The great tribulation. The end of the times, time of the Gentiles. The end of of the, the dream, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the conclusion. So it is that exclusive reward then essentially being that same described in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel and Paul had this yearning heart for understanding and the knowledge of God. Then, he, then said he unto me, Gabriel, 
Fear not, Gabriel to Daniel. Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me. But lo, Michael came to help me. There was a breakthrough when Michael came to help him. What was the message to be given Daniel? That What was that message to be given to Daniel that the powers of Satan resisted so greatly for 21 days before Michael intervened? Well, I suppose you could write a book about what that message was, but it just capitalized it. It was the word of life. It was imparted skill. I came to give you the word, the meanings of the word, and understanding and skill. I call that grace. I'd call that divine influence on my heart. I need some skill. I, I, I'm awaiting that the Lord would come unto me and, and grant unto me understanding, a spirit of understanding in the wisdom of a spirit of knowledge in the wisdom and understanding of God. A spirit of, of knowledge, uh, uh, skill. About what? Well, essentially about the kingdom of Christ, but what shall befall his people in the latter days? What shall befall thy people in the latter days? What was this word? It was an expose of not only the last days, but an unveiling of, of the realities of the heavenly unseen forces and conflict therein. Wasn't it? You remember? It's so familiar to us, but how, how revealing that was. Where, where was it ever written? We have no... I'm sure it was, but we have none. We have no written uh, spirit inspired word of such happenings anywhere other than right here in the Old Covenant. Where there is a battle being waged in the heavens above between good angels and bad angels, wherein that battle can be so persistent and so much resistance that the archangel of God had to be called to intervene to accomplish what God has spoke the word to do? Hmm. That's a great expose. That, that which precipitated Michael's direct involvement was that great resistance by the forces of Satan to a revelation message granted to a beloved prophet that would bring more of the realities of the word of life and spiritual conflict into the fanciful world. I'm going to tell you what. Your understanding of God and your knowledge of God granted to you will bring more conflict into the world. Why, will, why does he resist so hard your understanding, your knowledge, your moving forward? Because it, 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 the, it's exponential. You, you represent the possibilities of, uh, of, of, of creating a greater dynamic of conflict with understanding and knowledge. How much more of a threat to the kingdom of Satan and how much more of an aid to the kingdom of Christ are you with skill and understanding? The battle... Was, to, was a resistance on several levels, but it was a resistance by Satan to bring into this world, into his world, this word of life. This, it was, if you will, it was a word out of time. It was, it was something as like the demon said to Christ, did you come to cause us to suffer before our time? This is a word out of time. Wow, did it come by the persistence of the beloved prophet fasting and praying and seeking God.
It was a moment of spiritual knowledge that's key to all end time overcoming knowledge. These words that we reread here were fought for. They were fought for in a heavenly realm. We're, we're reading words that only came through a great battle. Well, they only got to us because there was a great battle. And the archangel intervened. And the beloved prophet prayed. And it's key to all of our end time understanding. How lost would we be without the Word of God? I'd be in a bar somewhere today, I can tell you that. Or somewhere uh, comforting myself. My woe, my poor, whatever I could figure out, I could excuse myself to do. Without the Word of God, there... This, this, this is the battle. I mean, Satan is not, uh, uh, not excited about God speaking his word into the earth, into man. He doesn't want man to have any of God's word. It, it, only, it only bodes bad for him if it's gleaned, understood, and walked in. So it was this spiritual battle that preceded this knowledge that that was key to our overcoming knowledge. And it's to be increased like never before, according to the Word. A word spoken out of time, and when it is time, so will the intense battle resume. The resistance will be great to dis... uh, (laughs) <laughs> whatever I wrote there, discover. Yeah, the resistance will be great against our discovering in those words a right knowledge of God's revelations. What are you talking about, Mike? I'm speaking to you about something that I alluded to last week, and that is that this chapter, Daniel 12, this first verse is uh, is that time frame in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 7, where it says, and there was war in heaven. Why? Why? There there was, or the, the literal is Greek, and there arose war in the first heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. It is in this future when the Jews will be reinstituting the temple sacrifices. Now, I'm going to go pretty quick right from here, so you're going to have to have your ears on. You can't, you can't be asleep now. It is in the future when the Jews will be reinstituting the temple sacrifices that that great persecution will come against Christians and followers of Christ in the land. In that day, Christians will be perceived as threats to the peace of the Jews who will have recently acquired religious rights in the reinstitution of the Mosaic sacrifices. Daniel 9.27 John 5:43, Isaiah 66, 1, Revelation 11, 1 through 3. Well, let's just read one of those proof scriptures. Let's just read Isaiah 66. What am I saying? Hey, really? I'm saying that once that this covenant has been made with the leadership of the Jews in the land for them to reinstitute the Mosaic sacrifices then Christians will have rise up in great objection, and Christians will also then be uh, greatly persecuted. But what's God's perspective of this event? What, what, what's His perspective? We're going to see a part of His perspective when we look at these scriptures I mentioned. Isaiah 66, verse 1, where it says, Thus says the Lord, The heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that they will build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? 
For all those things have mine hand made, and all those things have been since, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that, ha that is poor and of contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. He that kills an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb is as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abomination. I also will choose their delusions and will bring their fears upon them. I am suggesting to you this, that this time that, that uh, Michael stands up is clear in Daniel uh, to have been uh, the first time when Gabriel was attempting to deliver a message from God to Daniel and engaged the resistance of the uh, fallen angels in that he could not deliver the message unto Daniel until Michael intervened and then he was able to deliver the message. And I'm suggesting to you that this, this event, when Michael stands up, or he intervenes again, here in the 12th chapter of Daniel, in the first and second verses, is that time which is alluded to in the 12th chapter of Revelation, the 7th verse, wherein that uh, there is a great war arose, and at that time, Michael stood up. The great war that arose was at the basis of it was in the similar or was similar to that of the type wherein there was there is a great threat in the earth uh, through through the word of God in the increase of knowledge and understanding the things that are going to transpire at that point causes a great war, great resistance in the heavens above wherein Michael stands up. And it is at that point that we are pointing to that in these latter days, knowledge will be increased like never before. Overcoming knowledge. It's a word spoken out of time again. And there is this intense battle again that resumes. It is in this future time that the temple Sacrifices are being reinstituted. It is at that, according to, and in harmony with that covenant with death and with the covenant with the Antichrist, who is the one that has led the charge to allow the Jews to reestablish these temple sacrifices, that then Christians followers of and followers of Christ in the land will will be threats so they'll be perceived as threats to the peace of the Jews and Christians in the land will be the first to receive that uh, will be the first to receive the the persecution by the then governmental authorities of Israel in the land. No, I don't suppose that 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 you 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 could easily glean that that is the case, other than that the practical sense is that in the latter days the Antichrist responds to to trouble in the land. And the, a part of that trouble in the land would be a, a, an, inharmon, a, an unharmonious, what's the right word for harmony? No, no, no harmony that would be created by the dynamic of, of believing Jews, 
uh, two witnesses that are testifying, and they're testifying of the Lord. They're testifying of Him as, as the true Messiah, which causes a conversion into a Christian form. They're not... They, 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 in other words, though they are, they're preaching a message that is more of the tri- down the lines of Christ the Messiah, the line of the tribe of Judah. Yet they, he, they, the the two witnesses, are preaching a message in harmony with the Christian gospel. Thereby, people are being converted from Judaism and converted from unbelief, just Jews living in unbelief, to a, to a testimony about Christ that comes from the two witnesses. And because of that, the, the, this dynamic we see in Israel is a great hatred for the two witnesses. What spurs the hatred? It's the message that aligns itself with Jesus Christ. So where do I get that they are, the Christians are persecuted by the Jews in the land at that time is from Scripture in that I've drawn the the likely, practical, and unarguably the right conclusion that the two witnesses are hated by the majority of the governmental entities of Israel. And it is them who are afraid of losing their agreement uh, because of the pressure that the two witnesses and the Christians that they are those that they've converted are bringing to bear on the leadership and now the newly reinstituted sacrifice is being offered. Here's this great opposition. We fought for 2,000 years to get here, and now these guys are stirring up all this trouble that threatens our covenant with the Antichrist, or with the great leader, with their Messiah, with the Messiah in their mind. So that, that will turn against those Christians that are in the land who are faced with now uh, living or dying for their testimony. Yes, I am a Christian, and no, I don't believe in the sacrifice. Yes, I believe in Christ, blah, 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 blah. This, on two fronts, infuriates the Antichrist. It infuriates him against Christianity. It infuriates him against Judaism, as he he has a hatred for both anyway, uh, for for all religion. And so the fear of the loss of the covenant and their rights that they had so long fought for causes them to persecute Christians, Jews to persecute Christians. And when I say Jews, you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about religious Jews. I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about just a regular Jew on the, on the street. It, not a dissimilar situation from that that dynamic that was around the first coming of Christ, wherein many of the people would have followed John and followed the uh, uh, followed the Lord, had it not been for the governmental authorities, for the priesthood, for those those men, uh, and so there the resistance comes from the top. And goes down. Is, is that, Debbie, does that give you somewhat of an answer? There's a deeper one. There's a broader one, but does that help? So, what I was going to say was those references that I give, Daniel 9, 27, John 5, 43, Isaiah 66, uh, 1 through 5, Revelation 11, 1, 3, don't tell the whole story. No, they, you got to go, you have to understand mystery Babylon. You have to understand the persecution that comes on Christians from them, and part of that is not only uh, Catholicism, but Jude- Judaism. So all of those dynamics in the end time are working against the Christian in the land that that blows up into all the world. It goes; it's very locale, and it comes from out of that. Once the abomination of desolation is set forth, 
then from there forward, it is no more of this stuff. No more of this Judaism. No more of these sacrifices. No more of this Christianity. No more of this stuff. I'm going to be your God. You want to buy? You want to sell? You're going to have to have my mark. We're going to stop all this, this, this craziness. We're going to stop all this madness. We're going to, we're going to serve me. And I'll serve you. I'm your God. And from that center, from that moment, from that definite time, that period, that moment in time, there will go out from that the, the edict that it will cover the world to, that, uh, that, will, that will bring persecution both to Jews and Christians throughout the whole world. He'll chase them down in the country first, but then in all the countries in the Mediterranean area, and then as far as he can go, where the word says that his his power, his sphere is worldwide. So you're not going to be untouched. You're not going to be at the center of of this turmoil, but we're not going to escape it. We're not going to get away from it. I said, it doesn't matter that I finish lessons so much as I just try to get on a track going forward. So the Antichrist comes and I'm three and a half years going out of the pit. So, so, so if the Antichrist comes out of the pit at the three and a half year period, how could he have been part of a covenant, you know, three and a half years later to confirm the covenant for seven years? Yeah. Well, that is an enigma, isn't it? It's, it is, do you think it's an impossibility? No, I just think that's why people think it's a living person. Because, oh, yeah. because yeah. you would have to be there for the right. covenant with many, according right. to Daniel 9 27 or whatever. Exactly, 9 27. Well, the only way to answer that, the only way to, to connect the dots, is that there are two people. I do. I, I don't like to go on record as, uh, but I don't. I mean, just because it causes so much. Uh, a, body is just a, body. a body is just a body. And <laughs> well, the, the, the idea that you bring up, or or the problem in that, how is it that he can come, be raised from the dead, and 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 be this guy that comes out of the pit, but yet how would his his time frame have taken him back three and a half years before that if he didn't come out of the pit until the middle of the of of the tribulation? That's the quandary. But if there is a man that is alive at the time of the making of the pack that is is killed in the middle of the pack and he dies, his soul leaves his body, and there is another who makes a pact with the devil, who's, whose body was Moses'? Well, there was an argument about it. Okay, but there's not going to be an argument about this body, whose it is. It's going to be Satan's body. Okay, you with me? Jude, I'm talking about Jude, an argument over the body, Michael and, okay, and Satan. The body uh, of this person then ha- is accessible to the resuscitated soul of the pet. Okay? Okay? That, I know it makes sense to, to somebody spiritually minded, and at least they'll mull over it and, uh, and meditate and pray about it. But to someone just hearing on the inner tube what I just said, it's like, what? What a crazy idea. What a crazy thought. But, if you want a solution to what seems to be an impossibibility, there, uh, a, a conflict in the scriptures of how it could be that there was a pact for seven years and the one that made it with him was this, it was this man, and then how was it that he came at the mid-trib from the pit? That's one explanation. I would say there's more than one explanation, but there, that's one. I would say another scriptural backing for that is the body would be, see, Jesus... 
you know, the body is totally decay. So it would have to be fresh body, pretty much, for the soul to go into that and re, you know, to live again. You see, he went, he, he, he died. The guy got a wound unto death. And that everybody agrees that he's dead. he really died. It wasn't just a wound. He was killed. This man. But then he's resurrected. But when he's resurrected, he's resurrected with powers. See? He now comes forth in the middle of the tribulation at the height with powers. Power, supernatural powers that he's even able to kill the two witnesses of God who have then themselves supernatural power. Who, whoever comes out against them, they destroy them with a Breath out of them, with fire coming out of them, but they couldn't do anything to the Antichrist. He declares war on them. He kills them. Who can stand against this man? He's back from the dead. He's resurrected in power. Well, where did that come from? Where did the that spirit of that he's in come? Satanic. It's a pact made. For, he he is of the seven, but he's not. He's. That's the whole explanation there of the, the that he was and he was is not and he will be. That's the whole explanation is, is that he is dead, but he will rise up and he will live again. And that is this soul, this spirit infused with Satan that comes into this body. Then when it does, that body comes up as the same body, but that that's in it is not the same. And its power is not the same. Its wisdom is not the same. And nothing about that body is now the same as it was. So when you connect the dots and you're trying to determine this mystery as how, how he, his name is 666, how did he, how, how does he alive, alive, then dead, and then alive, and how could he be a part of those? And, the, and that, all of that is answered in the explanation that I just gave you in a nutshell. It'd take him in a half an hour or an hour to get into it in any depth at all. But you have a way of drawing this stuff out of me when I, I don't want to talk about it. You know, I don't talk about it much because, as I said, it's not, it's something that you have to come, in, come unto. If you, if you hit between the eyes with it, you're going to back off of everything that's been said. Everything that we've laid down, all these promises and the, and the judgments and the truths that are brought out in connecting the prophetic word is, is all, all of a sudden the wall goes up because, wow, did you hear what he just said? So I, I like to avoid that, even though I'm not afraid of that. I, you know, I'm, I'm giving an explanation as to... I'm not afraid it's declared. I just said. But I... I'm just saying that hey, there's a point where you where you put these things forward. You don't you don't come into kindergarten and start teaching algebra. You know there's a point. No, but if they listen one time, they're gonna. And that I was, I'm always concerned about it causing somebody to stumble out of the gates. But uh, you know, not overly. I'm not over the time. Time is short. Uh, we're, we are overlaying the book of Daniel over the book of Revelation. We're talking about uh, Revelation and the subjects. Is key here is the Antichrist. Who is he? Where does he come from? It's important. But I don't like to just throw it out there without really getting into it. I'll get into it again, okay? I promise, and we might we might just you know have a whole lesson uh, that that'll be just about the Antichrist because the twelfth you know we're in the twelfth chapter of Daniel we're about to leave Daniel and I'm not of a mind to leave the prophetic word of God yet I think there's still a lot of God would have us to to move in you know in the understand the prophetic side of it in these days in these times. And so I'm not about I'm not about thinking about moving away from it, and I think that's what I meant by be patient with me here on the twelfth chapter of Daniel. I'm not of a mind to move on to something else real quickly. I, I think there's a lot can be tied by using Daniel still in the twelfth chapter and what we've learned and 
and and talk a lot about the book of Revelation, a lot about end time prophecy without ever leaving this book. So maybe that's a part of it is is going into a deeper explanation of what I just laid out for you in uh, overview. We all are you are you done? Can you can you hang in there a little bit longer? I already ruined your afternoon anyway, so allow me just to finish it off. I, I still don't feel like I've gotten to the to the the, the, the crux of this matter. Uh, yeah, the four winds of judgment. Uh, I was trying to explain so poorly. I got it in my heart, not in my head so much. I was trying. I was trying to explain to you the dynamics in the land at this time. Uh, at this time, uh, middle of the tribulation period. What we have in the, I believe it's the sixth chapter of Revelation, we have the, this type where the Lord speaks. Is it the sixth chapter? wherein we have the four angels holding back the four winds of judgment. Uh, that's Revelation 7, 1 through 3. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth. Well, these, this, is the, this is the judgments of God, the judgments of man, the, the maneuvers of Satan, whatever entails... The wind. Uh, he, these things are held back. They're, they can't proceed on their natural course uh, be, until there is a marking uh, or a sealing uh, of the 144,000 that are listed out in the, uh, starting in the fourth verse of chapter 7 going to, through verse 8. Those are the 144,000 zealots or Israelites that have now been sealed. They've been sealed. Not, and I put in parentheses there, although they're not, they are still subject to great trial, they've been sealed, meaning that their hearts are, are of, such, uh, of such condition that they... Like those of the first fruits offering, are are sealed in their heart from falling in the great temptation. Are you with me on that? So where where the hundred where the 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 first fruits offering are are kept kept out of. Or, taken away from the great temptation, these 144,000 are going to remain on the earth during the, the remainder of the tribulation. So because they are remaining in the tribulation, but because their hearts are in this condition, like those that are of the first fruits condition, that, but they are, they are uh, believers that um, the vast majority of them having come uh, through the ministry of the two witnesses. The two witnesses uh, 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 accomplished this work in that, that they brought into the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, these 144,000. And uh, Daniel 12 B is a reference to this time frame when this is happening. It says, And at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. What, what it's a reference to, this chapter, that verse, is a reference to the people of Israel. That the, the the vision is a, is given to Daniel to show him what things will fall befall or come upon Israel in the end times. 
and this word of, of those people shall be delivered that are written in the book is the, is the, is the practical um, application of the seal that is, that is after the sixth seal is open and before the seventh seal is open, uh, the, the, the seals on the book, the little book, but in the seventh chapter, we're talking about a sealing in their foreheads of this 144,000 that's alluded to in the 12th chapter in the first verse, uh, the last part, in that then their names are those that are written in the book. These 12 from every tribe. So it is that in during the la- remainder of the tribulation, they are not subject to the, the, the taking or falling for or, uh, the lies that, are, that will be uh, propagated uh, by the satanic forces, including the frogs in the 16th chapter of Revelation, the deceiving spirits. They're not subject to them. Why? Because there, is, because there is an increased knowledge. The two witnesses bring about what Gabriel and Michael brought about in these people in that they were able to impart unto them skill and understanding in the Word of God wherein this sealed them. The, this knowledge, this zeal, this heart sealed them in that they were now not subject to the lies, uh, the deceit, the great deceiving lies uh, and acts of Satan that the word says that it was such so deceiving that even that if it was possible, and it is possible because God shortened the days, that the elect might be deceived. Are you with me? There's a di- spiritual dynamic that's involved in the, in the four winds of judgment that before we proceed any further, these, these that, that are... Uh, that are chosen by God, the, the elect of God. He said He would not be without. The elect of God, he, he, he allows the two witnesses to bring the testimony into the earth that will influence these 144,000 to a, to a place where they are sealed. Jeremiah had in view Daniel 12, 1, the event, uh, in that he said, Alas, for the day is great, so great that none is like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So the he shall be saved out of it. Uh, part of that contingent is found here in the seventh chapter, the first seven verse, or eight verses of the seventh chapter of the book of Revelation. And when, what, 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 what is the time frame? It's when Michael shall stand again, and that is when knowledge, knowledge in Israel of Jesus Christ shall be increased. In in Jim's prayer, he said, all by grace, all by the divine influence of God. If it were not for God's divine influence, we would all perish. This is the God's divine influence in, in Israel, in the Jewish nation. These are 12 from every tribe. As God's divine influence, He will save them out of it. He will save them in it. And it'll be through the knowledge of His Son, not through the covenant, the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant. They won't come to the knowledge of Yahweh through the Mosaic covenant. That's not, that's not the process here.
The two prophets will be in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ crucified. He's the one that will empower them. They And they, for 42 months in supernatural skill, shall reveal the long-hidden knowledge of the true Messiah to Israel in opposition to those who made the covenant with Antichrist. How long did the two witnesses witness? 42 months. And then what happened to them? They were killed by the Antichrist. So the 42 months, and the, and the 70th week of Daniel is only seven years long, so three and a half years, 42 months, the two witnesses testify of Christ, the Messiah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and it's in this time frame that the 144K are sealed. But at the end of this witnessing, this testifying, then at the end of 42 months comes this, the Antichrist who comes up out of the abyss in the anointing of Satan and kills the two witnesses, beginning the reign of terror on the earth for what period of time is it constituted to be his? Three and a half years. The 13th chapter of Revelation reveals to us. So we have the three and a half years and the three and a half years, and we have this dynamic. And Michael stands up, and there arose war in heaven. This is when the dynamic of the casting out of Satan down to the earth. And he is in, in anger. And it is at that point that, that Michael has stood up in battle and Satan enters in to Hades with now the keys of Hades. Chapter 9, Revelation 9.1, we won't get into it in depth, but Revelation chapter 9.1 says this, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit. So, so it is then that these two, these two witnesses, are, in, are confronted and encountered the resurrected Antichrist, or the resurrected one of the past that is now the Antichrist. And it is then that they, the two, will reach the zenith of the great opposition of the political, religious powers, then of both the seen and the unseen world. Just as Daniel did. He was getting a lot of resistance. Um, here we have this dual dynamic going on where he, on the earth the two witnesses are hated, aren't they? They send gifts to one another when they get one thing. When the Antichrist kills those two guys, the whole world celebrates. <laughs> you know, it wasn't the gospel that they were preaching. It was Christ the Messiah, King of Kings, Lion of the tribe of Judah. Are you with me? He's the Redeemer. His blood paid for him, but they're, he, they're not preaching the gospel of turn the other cheek, <laughs> even though they are, you know what I'm saying. It's a, it's a different dynamic. And so they're, they're not well-liked or well-received, they're, they're hated, and the whole world rejoices in their death. And if the whole earth rejoices in their death, that, that leads right to what it says in the 13th chapter, that, they, that the earth, the world worshipped the Antichrist and the devil. And really that's what it's all about for him. The devil is, the, is worshipped. So they will, these two witnesses will, they'll come against this great opposition, the unseen world and the seen world, in heaven just above this earth, just as in the days of Daniel when the dark angel forces greatly resisted in the heavenly realm. But now Satan himself and all his principles will rise up and wage heavenly war 
and Satan and his angels will be defeated and in rage cast forever out. He's not coming back, friends, to the heavens. He's not going back into the heaven of heavens. He's cast out of there. He was cast down to these heavens above and those that have to do with this earth and this world. And when he's cast down from there, he's cast down to the earth, never to re return to the heavens above. And when he's cast down from there, he's cast down into the pit where he's chained up. And from there he will be released for a short season, and then from there he will be cast into the lake of fire. That's the destiny of Satan. Yes. That's going to be at the end of the millennium. Right. And that's when, before the great white throne appears, right. we have the war, the ark. God, the war of Gog and Magog. Yeah, definitely a war. There's a war right so, there. So yep. that's the that's the war of Armageddon, right? Armageddon is here at the first return of Christ, at the second return of Christ. The and this is a different war here at, at the at the time of of the end of Ezekiel's. At the end of Ezekiel's period, time of the temple, when he comes against the people of the land, Satan is released. Twenty. Yes. 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 Yes, that's the word of God. That's uh, Revelation chapter twenty. Yeah, and we might talk about this later because there's a lot of things there to discuss as far as Gog and Magog. A lot of things yet there to discuss, but in principle, you got it now. Okay, <laughs> and so these these dark angels resisted the good angels, but now Satan and all of his angels are entered into a resistance and they are then cast down to the earth. I love Isaiah 24, 21. I just can't help. When we were in Isaiah, I, I spent time talking about it. I went to this book of Revelation because it's so explicit And it shall come to pass, this is Isaiah 24, And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high and the kings that are on the earth. It's, it's, a, it's so explicit. It's so revealing. It so lays over what D Daniel 12, 1 says over what Revelation Revelation. Uh, it tells us it uh, it's it, here in the twelfth chapter of Revelation for the first uh, casting down of these high ones, and then later in the nineteenth chapter, even a further judgment. And no place will then be found above for them or him, as those heavens are now made holy. Christ, right? It's the investiture. He's become king of kings, at, or we could put kings of gods, in that he has now he is now possessing that heavenly realm from where Satan has operated all these millenniums. Now Christ in his investiture, I, I was it's 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 the beachhead. It's from where he now works in his investiture. He is now taken and cast out uh, Satan and his angels down to the earth. And now Christ is, rules as king of kings in the first heavens above. 
wherein the heavens are now to be occupied with the first fruits man child, Revelation 12, 5, in fulfillment of Revelation 3, 7, and 10. Revelation 3, 10 just says, well, we're going to read it. Revelation 3. I'm just, I need to just not worry about you all getting mad at me. Revelation 3, 7, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write these things saith he that is holy he that is true he that hath the key of David he that openeth no man shutteth shutteth no man openeth I know thy works behold I have set before thee an open door and no man can shut it for thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name behold I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not but do lie Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. So that promise is fulfilled at the same time as the casting down of Satan, which is at that mid-trib point, close to the mid-trib. Trib, they are caught up. Satan is cast down. The Antichrist takes takes uh, uh, his throne on the, on the earth. And his, his, the time of, of the great uh, Jacob's trouble, according to Jeremiah, now begins. The, 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 the actual tribulation period. The great, temptation great. It is now that on the earth that there shall be a trouble such as never was since there was a nation. Daniel 12.1. So how many, how many would agree that Daniel 12.1, how many would agree that there can't be more than one time of trouble that has never been or that shall ever be? Right? It's, it can only be one time, right? It's pretty, I mean, it narrows it down to no other choice. So it... it the, the, the time that Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 is alluding to is obviously the same time that is brought forth in the book of Revelation, the last three and a half years. So that, that should be solid in everybody's saying. There shouldn't be any question that that's where this word and there shall be a time for as such as never was since there was a nation is representing that last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. You remember, it's, it's Daniel talking about Daniel. We're all, we're all about understanding that the last seven-year period is that 70th week of Daniel, when all of these things shall be fulfilled, all of these things meaning those visions that we've already went through in the book of Daniel, how they, how they play out and how the Antichrist is incorporated into those visions that he had and this time frame of three and a half years. Three and a half years time the Lord served, ministered on the face of the earth. That's how long he was on, served humbly, gave up rulership and came down to the earth. That's how long he will come up from the dead. And this is a humility. <laughs> see, see the reciprocals? It's all the reciprocals. It's, it's Satan's counter to everything God does. Here's the counter. You can find it and just go down the list. Somebody ought to do that someday and just write a book on, the, on how Satan counters and, and counterfeits everything that God does and, and tie it into prophecy. So we're in the destiny of the Jews is in the time of the end. Uh, well, let me back up. In the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week now begins. It begins with what? Michael standing up, right? Doesn't Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 tell us, and at that time, Michael stands up, and that there will be a trouble like no other time. So when does the last three and a half years start? When Michael stands up. So when Michael stands up, it's the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th year, 70th week, and that story of what happens in that three and a half year period is foretold and unfolds in detail in Revelation chapters 12 through 20. That's it. 
chapters 12 through 20 is what describes this last three and a half years after Michael stands up. It describes it in perfect clarity once you've discerned what, 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 what prophecy is speaking of. The scenes in Jerusalem... back up, is now on the earth no, I'm, I'm, I'm just going through my mind here the scenes in Jerusalem under the Antichrist enter at 11.1 can we read 11.1? Revelation 11.1 and there was given me a reed like unto a rod and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. The scenes in Jerusalem under the Antichrist enter at 11.1 and continue through with other events throughout the last 1260 days. What began that? What? What? I don't want to go go back and repeat everything we said last week. But remember, this is the abomination of desolation. That's the midpoint. That, that's why it's so critical to locate that midpoint, and then you can work the events off of that midpoint, forward and backward. So we know that the Antichrist reigns for 42 months. We know the Lord said in the 24th chapter of Matthew that that, will, that that beginning of his reigning was with the abomination of desolation. We know at that time that the rest of the child, rest of the children of the woman in the 12th chapter of Revelation flee into the wilderness. We know those on the left on the earth are to flee. We know they're going to flee because the Antichrist will pursue them. We will know that he will kill the two witnesses at that time. We know that he will raise from the dead the, the Antichrist. So yeah, there's a lot happening right then, quickly following, and Rome is destroyed. So it's a, it's, it's a big deal right there. It's not going to be mista any mistaking of, of that time frame. The scenes in Jerusalem under the Antichrist enter in at 11.1 and continue then through the other events through the last 1260 days, all from 12.2 to 21. This is the last of the 1260 days, including the sounding of the seventh trumpet and the seven vials, Revelation chapter 16, there are, then there isn't, in, I'm, I'm reading, I'm, I'm actually going over the whole chapter 12 with you without, without you knowing it, but because it's there we discover this 1260 again, it's there that we discover the 30 days that go beyond the 1260, and it's there that go, we discover the 45 days that go beyond that 30. And there is, in, in, to me anyway, I don't know, uh, it just says that blessed are the survivors who wait for what these days represent and their events are here untold. But we have the unfolding of the, these perilous times like there never has before and the Antichrist ruling reigning and Michael standing up, 1260 days plus 30 plus 45. But all of the days that the Antichrist fit into the 1260 because that's three and a half years, that's 42 months and that's when he his kingdom comes to an end. But there's a blessing that goes beyond the end of the, of the Antichrist's judgment, the last vial, the seventh plague, the 16th chapter, uh, that has a blessing for those that wait. Whatever that means. I, it puzzles me. I think I, I have a thought on it, and I'd like to, to, to try to ferret out whether my thought is true, but there's a time frame there of 30 days and and 45 more that extend to a real blessing for those that wait. 
I just want to mention because that's mentioned in the 12th chapter, the 11th and 12th verses of Daniel. Then those of, the, the, of that first conversion, who is those of that first conversion? That's the 144,000 plus. That's those that are the first one. And then the faithful Jews. So you have, besides those converted, you have faithful Jews now. You can't just say, well, there's no faithful Jews. Yeah, there are born-again faithful Jews on the earth at that time, as there is in this time. Uh, godly men, more godly than us. You know what I'm saying by that? What I mean by that? Uh, you got to always consider that that there are those of the 144,000, those conver converts of the two witnesses. Then there's the faithful Jews, and then there are Christians that are remaining, that didn't, that weren't, they weren't ready. They were unripe. They are they are here, my friends. They're here. The worst of the worst is now getting ready to happen. All these things have transpired in the heavens and on the earth and under the earth. And now those on the earth are going, whoa, 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 unto those that are on the earth. For he comes down in great wrath, for he knows his time is short. Hallelujah in the heavens and they're rejoicing. The first fruits are dancing and jumping in the heavens. They're happy. They're gloriously filled. But on the earth, whoa, whoa, whoa. And so it is. You have those three groups. You have, you have the converted Jews, you have the godly Jews, and you have the Christians, the sleepy-headed, not ready Christians, the Laodosians. They're here. And, and you know what? They're going to be here the full span of that three and a half years. And that three and a half years, is going to be like doggy years, you know what I mean? I mean, three and a half equal what? Seven or however. And yeah, yeah, I'm just saying, you know, it's easy to, three and a half years go by pretty fast when you have a good time. But when you're not, three and a half years is a long, long, long time. And that's, and it's going to be stretched out because every moment's going to be fearful. 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 Terrible time. I mean, I don't have to get into that a whole lot. You know, all the scriptures, right? Paul said, that, you know, he's taken out of the way. The, the Spirit of the Lord. It's gone. The, the, this, the grace and mercy time. It's transitioning. It's gone. The salt's gone. It, it's a terrible time. Spiritually. It, which equates to this terrible atmosphere that when I landed in Saudi Arabia, in 1971, at first time, and got off the plane, you, I, it felt like I, were, I had lost my compass. I almost hit the tarmac. The spiritual weight of that country nearly laid me out on the tarmac. It was so dark. I mean, you just got off and boom, it was there. Like stepping off into to a place where God wasn't. You've been used to God. Oh, you're excited about God. I don't get the opportunity to talk to people about God. You just every day prayer. All of a sudden, you're in this atmosphere and you just step off into a place where there is no God, and you can feel it. It's tangible. That's the way it's going to be in that period of time. This period of time is going to have an atmosphere that will be discernible. You can feel it. It's tangible. Well, it's a place without God. It's void without God. Jim. Yoke of bondage during this time. The yoke of bondage. Yeah. First of all, the word of God says about the yoke of bondage as it relates to Christians. The Christians uh, were uh, set free from the yoke of bondage. As, and I don't know what, which line you're thinking of, Jim, but down this line, the Galatians chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, those chapters re relate to Paul's teaching to the Galatians that you're no longer under the yoke or the bondage of the law, the Mosaic law. So at the time, at this time, you know, I, I, th this time is, is there is a, 
a great yoke or a bondage, obviously, that's a lot of pressure uh, being brought to bear. I mean, if the atmosphere, if the situation, if the circumstances are one when they are celebrating the reinstitution of the Mosaic law, you can bet that the bondage to the law has heightened greatly throughout the world. I mean, Jews are embracing it, but others are embracing. Uh, wow, we're back. We're, they're back in the land. Ezekiel's temple is built. They're sacrificing. They've overcome. The Messiah is coming. All that stuff, you know. Uh, yeah, religious f- fervor is, is heightened. And so there uh, it is a bondage there that I would think that would, would be temptation uh, for Christians to, again, I think it is today. You know, I, I, I'm of a mind that the world is covered with this messianic movement, which is just, you know, a, it's taking a truth and just spun it off. It's taking the reality uh, historical significance and truth of the old covenant and spun it off. It's taking a doctrine and spun it off. It's like, you know, taking one or two verses of the new covenant and spinning it off and making a whole denomination of prosperity out of it. I mean, it's it's lies that are being propagated through the word of God. So there is this movement today, this messianic movement uh, that uses as its disguise, it's ju- Judaizers, and a lot of it is just Judaizers that are bringing Christians that are in freedom back under the yoke of the bondage of the law. It's, it's, it's real. I mean, I don't know that it's any less real today than when Galatians was written. I think that, that Christians, n- new and old Christians, are as subject to the nuances of the bondage of the law as they were when Paul wrote to the Galatians. So the, the, I don't see it getting less. There's this un, unity that is moving forward in the world for the, the joining together of the denominationalism uh, to become one again in, in harmony and moving forward. This is Mystery Babylon. It is being played out. Listen, I've heard him say on TV, one great leader, charismatic leader in the country, in the world, said, Protestant, I'm not protesting anything. Meaning, we need to gather together with the Catholics. We need to, to walk and step in harmony with the Catholics. Uh, they're, they love Jesus. We love Jesus. And the, so there's this bringing back under the fold uh, on, under the names of the denomination that brings us into the, those bondages. And a part of that is this movement, this messianic movement, that you have Jews, or messianics, I should say, messianics who are, are tending, are, are vying for the favor of the Pope. And so we have denominations, uh, charismatics, messianics, that are now uniting uh, holding seminars uh, with the Pope address, Christian seminars, charismatic Christians, I'm talking about Catholics, charismatic Christians holding seminars where the Pope is addressing them in their preludes, in their beginnings in the prayer, prayer before and after by, by uh, televised, uh, by whatever, by satellite, yeah, by not by Skype, but one of these other conferencing streaming things. You don't see a problem with that? <laughs> I will tell you, this is exactly what we're talking about here. It's bondage. It's, it's what's going to disinherit us. We're not going to have, we're, gonna, we're not going to be, we're not going to be a part of the first fruits offering if we are following after some of this stuff. Is that kind of what you were talking about, Jim, as far as it relates to the bondage? So let me finish up here. Uh, I was speaking about those different 
groups, the first converted, the faithful Jews and the Christians that are be remaining in Jerusalem. They will flee into the wilderness according to Matthew 24 and Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God and they should feed her there, how long? A thousand, two hundred and three score days. So there's your three and a half year period again. So it's the last half, the Jacob's trouble that we're focusing on in the scripture. Satan will make war on and pursue the saints both in Israel and everywhere and overcome them. That is to say physically. As they are, isn't that what the 13th chapter of Revelation tells us? That he will overcome them and kill them. As they are commanded by Jesus Christ not to take up the sword to defend themselves. And if I have to give you the scriptures on that, I will. But you should know as a Christian that you are you're forbid to take up a sword to defend yourself. But you are to patiently endure even unto death. Revelation 13, 7 with chapter 14, 12 and 7 and verses 4 through 8 with 9 through 14. I was going to read those and explain it, but I'm not going to for the time. Satan having obtained the keys to the abyss in the war in the heavens of chapter 12, which is seen in Revelation 9.1, I can't give you a, a reason or how it is that he ended up with the keys, but I would say from a judicial standpoint in the war, uh, he, he was able to rest the keys for, for a very uh, short period of time. He shall then release from the bowels of the earth its wicked forces upon man. He will have, just read the ninth chapter of Revelation. He will have entered into the man bound for perdition. In a similar manner is the way that he entered into Judas. And grants him his throne upon the earth, his powers, his skills over all his remaining kingdom. Revelation 13, 1 and 2. It is then that the Antichrist will be manifest and in the serpent's power come against the two witnesses of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem and kill them. For 42 months they have ministered the message of Messiah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, in great irresistible power. They have successfully resisted all the Gentile powers with supernatural abilities, destroying their enemies and thwarting their consolidated efforts, and now they lay dead upon the streets of Jerusalem. The great attempt by Satan, the 13th chapter, the great attempt by Satan and the Antichrist to discredit their message. He then, in open defiance, Antichrist, he then, in open defiance of their message, and in his alliance, with those, and the alliance with those Jews he had treacherously covenanted with for the first three and a half years, he now violently throws off his back the bastard Christianity. He now enters into and sets himself up upon the sacred place and declares himself God. That's where I stopped reviewing Daniel chapter 12, and the book of Daniel, and trying to overlay it uh, over Revelation. That was my second so or so stab at it since we completed the book of Daniel. I intend to at least make one more stab at it, if you guys will bear with me, please. and Let, let me finish getting out of me what's in me as it l relates to this. And Sometimes I'm getting long-winded to get it out, but Please bear with me at least one more week. I wrote apostasy has followed apostasy. That of Christendom has followed that of Judaism. The world controlling the church, false teaching, false prophets, false messiahs, false culture and civilization, crime, ungodlessness, universal, all those things Are, are now obviously a part of the mystic church. The great apostasy in Christendom shall culminate in the Antichrist and bring the crisis of the Great Tribulation. The world still unconverted to the end, lying in the wicked one, 
the, je- the days of the Gentiles or the times of the Gentiles have, are soon to be completed. That, they only have three and a half years and, that, and then that's over. You know, I just write here. The condemnation, let me just write this. Condemnation of Christendom is the the, 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 the the height or the greatness, or I don't know what word I'd like to use. It's not this one, but I'll use it to get my point. Condemnation of Christendom is is their great militaries. Let's meditate on that. The condemnation of Christendom is the great mili- is their great militaries. Is their great militaries. In other words, the, wh- who are the great countries in the world today? Well, and over the last, oh, you know, number, hundreds of years, maybe thousand, it's Christians. It's Christian nations. It was England. Now, and now America. And, and, and what is their condemnation? It's their military might. That's our condemnation. <laughs> I, I don't know. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing to me how we, uh, as, you know, someone would say, what would you have us have? You know, no military, oppressed, whatever. I, I'm not, I'm not going to speculate on what we would have. I'm only going to speculate on to what Christ has called us, you and I, to do and to be. And you know what? What? What is our condemnation? You know, is 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 it the fortress of our whatever? No, it says in the Old Testament, "Don't multiply gold. Don't multiply horses. Horses is power." Gold is riches, and, uh, and if a nation has those things, it doesn't matter what they say. That shows that's everything about it, right? That says everything about our nation. When, when all we have to do is to look at our military and our zeal, not just our military, just our zeal for our military, uh, and and the attitude of it. it it's, you know, it's one thing to look at Russia, who is a godless nation, although they, you know, have a profession toward Christianity, but for a nation that declares itself a Christian nation, uh, everything belies the truth. All of our actions belie the truth. We're not a Christian nation. What is a Christian? Well, it ain't us. That's all I can say. It's, I, I mean, it ain't us. Now, there's Christians in this nation, but this is not a Christian nation. And what's, and I just want you to bring that to your attention because somehow, you know, America does have a role in here, right, somewhere? I mean, especially if it's in the next decade or two. We're not going to fade away that fast. But, so, you might think, well, we have a church on every corner. But you notice I call those bastard churches. I'm sorry. They're bastard churches. And I mean that in love. I don't, I'm not critically appraising them. I'm not throwing rocks at them. I'm just saying that the churches of today that are in this world, as a general rule, are pretentious and not not Christ-like. So so there you go. It doesn't matter that we have them. Matter of fact, it may be worse that we have one on each corner than 
you know. There's a true, truer purity of Christianity in places that are oppressed. I, I just say it. It's the reality. That's the truth. Sincere, sincere Christians uh, come through suffering. All this stuff is not, you know, very palatable to to get a big crowd. But the reality is that that uh, that's how we enter into the suffering. That's what Paul was praying in Philippians. Three. Now he's, man, I sought the Lord three times. You know, it's like Daniel. Hell yeah. God, man, I don't know. I don't understand this. I'm going to pray and I'm going to fast. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to get understanding. And well, Paul was under a similar predicament. You know, he's, having, he's having some problems, whatever they were. And he, he, he sought the Lord three times about it. And the Lord says, my grace is sufficient. And what he understood from that is, and the conclusion he came as in is, when the Lord sa said that to me, I understood it to mean that when I'm at my weakest, he is at his strongest. And now I glory. I glory in tribulation and trials and tests. See, we thrive under pressure. We die in prosperity. We die. We dry up. Whenever we are consumed with us, but when we're consumed with Him, and we're alive and we're flourishing, and this nation is is yeah, I don't have to yeah, I'm preaching to the choir. I'm just saying, think about that. Our condemn condemnation in this country is because one of the reasons is because of our great. It's it's a con. It's a con. What do you call it? A uh, yeah, it's a contradiction, but anyway, you got it. I'm grateful. Thank you, Father, for this uh, lesson. Thank you for these people that I think this is the longest one we've had in a long time. But I don't know what it is about today. Today was just everything was, it, well, no, it wasn't your fault. It was just the attitude of the day. It was, I'm just not going to be in a hurry. I mean, we, was that what it is? There was, it doesn't seem to be a lot of, uh, Angst about, usually I can feel it up here. It's tangible. Let me out of here! <laughs> I remember one girl saying that, actually, literally. <laughs> I remember I asked that question I asked today. Are you all ready to go? And the one girl over here, she said, yes. <laughs> I felt about an inch tall at that point. Yes, ma'am.